People spend close to one-third of their life sleeping, but not always at the most appropriate times of day. Sleep should help restore the body's natural energy. One person's sleep can turn into another person's nightmare. Snoring and sleep apnea can not only disrupt sleep, but also impact the quality of life while someone is awake, leading to reduced energy and activity, weight gain, memory loss, and impaired attention span. Sleep-related disorders such as sleep apnea and a snoring affect 10% of the population, and that statistic does not include all the unwilling victims. Hello, I'm Dr. Brett Levine, a board-certified ear, nose, and throat specialist, and I will be educating you about snoring and sleep apnea. There are several different types of sleep disorders, but here I will be discussing only snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. They represent a continuum of problems related to the narrowing of the airway that can range from the occasional noisy breathing and progress to the blockage of airflow that sounds like suffocation. Snoring can be a minor social annoyance from a loud shh to an elbow jab in the side pushing him off the bed to be forced next to the only one who will sleep with him. Sleep apnea can lead to a heart attack or a doze on the freeway leading to a motor vehicle accident, or maybe even divorce court. Why do these problems occur? Because something has caused narrowing of the airway while sleeping. If the narrowing is partial and there is still air moving in and out, it sounds like snoring. The vibration of tissues causes a noise we know as snoring. 50% of men snore and 30% of women snore. But if the collapse is complete, we hear the sleeper choke and stop breathing. This represents obstructive sleep apnea, and eventually the brain senses that there is no oxygen coming to it and wakes up the sleeper to take a gasp. The cycle repeats itself all night long. This often prevents the sleeper from ever getting into lengthy periods of deep sleep, and thus prevents the rest that the body requires during sleep. The risks of sleep apnea are much more serious than snoring. Patients with sleep apnea have two times the prevalence of high blood pressure, three times as much heart disease, such as chest pain, heart attacks, and arrhythmia. The risk of stroke is four times greater. Also, there is depression, sexual dysfunction, and impotence. A study from Virginia quoted a seven times higher rate of car accidents among patients with sleep apnea. In children with sleep apnea, there can be poor weight gain or obesity, and poor concentration. How do you know if a patient snores or has sleep apnea? <coughs> One of the challenges as a physician is that the patients who snore, and some even with mild sleep apnea, usually come in the office because their sleep partner has sent them, but they don't think they have a problem. They're sleeping, so they have no idea if they gasp, choke, or snore. In order to know, you need to ask the sleep partner, or relatives, or maybe even the neighbors. Let's be honest, many of these patients come into the office against their own will, or so they can return to their own bed. Patients with significant sleep apnea will tell you they wake up exhausted and fall asleep during the day. Sometimes they may report that their own snoring wakes them up. But that loud snore is usually followed by an episode where they have stopped breathing, and that is what actually wakes them up. The term heroic snoring is used to define snoring, which can be heard from outside the room where the patients sleep. Have you ever heard this? There are some complaints which should make us suspicious that a problem may be more than snoring and could be sleep apnea. Waking up tired in the morning after a full night's sleep, fatigue during the day, bad memory or poor concentration, waking up at night for no reason at all, loud gasps or choking sounds, morning headaches, a dry mouth, a dry sore throat in the morning. What, do, what does your doctor look for in an exam? The causative factors can be broken down into four groups, poor muscle tone, excessive bulky tissues, excessive length of redundant tissues, and excessive pressure. Poor muscle tone in the throat leads to collapse, especially of the tongue, but also the sidewalls of the throat and even the tonsils. 
This could include a lack of reasonable amount of sleep or over-relaxed tissues from alcohol or sleeping pills. Almost anyone who is exhausted or has drank too much alcohol will snore. Weak muscles from a nerve or muscle disease or even a stroke can also lead to collapse. Large adenoids and large tonsils can narrow the airway, especially in children. Also, a small lower jaw that is set back will cause the tongue to flop back and narrow the airway. A low hanging palate and long low uvula can lead to snoring and even collapse. If your nose is significantly blocked, this can cause you to breathe with greater force through your mouth and throat, leading to noise and even collapse. The nose plays a more significant role in snoring than sleep apnea. There are many causes of nasal congestion, including a cold, untreated allergies, sinus infection, septal deviation, or nasal polyps. Also, addiction to certain over-the-counter nasal decongestant sprays can lead to rebound swelling of the nose and a vicious cycle of addiction on those sprays. A septal deviation means the center partition of the nose is crooked to the extent that it limits adequate airflow. Nasal polyps are excessive tissue swelling which can block the nose. As you can see, these factors affect several different locations and levels, which is why anatomical problems and treatments vary from patient to patient. Most ENT specialists use a fiber optic endoscope to examine the anatomy, which cannot normally be seen with a flashlight and can help identify potential locations where collapse may occur. Once your physician completes his history and physical exam, if he suspects sleep apnea, the next step should be a sleep study. A sleep study is an overnight test where you go to sleep with monitors on your body and measurements are taken. The study objectively differentiates between annoying snoring and serious sleep apnea. Sleep studies are performed in sleep centers, which are widespread and also can be performed in your own home and bed. The results will affect how aggressively the problem is treated and if insurance will cover the treatment. Remember, sleep apnea is a medical problem, so most insurance companies will pay for their treatment if documented on a sleep study. Insurance companies consider snoring no different from a facelift or coloring your hair. It is usually not a covered benefit. The test itself is painless and lasts an entire night's sleep. And that may be a beautiful night for everyone else at home. Depending on the sleep study, most measure breathing pattern, oxygen levels, sleep positions, brain waves, eye movements, muscle tone and movements, heart rate and rhythm. The sleep study report tells us the number of apneas, which are defined as a cessation of breathing for 10 seconds or more, the number of hypopneas, which is defined, defined as decreased breathing or decreased oxygenation, and an index called a respiratory disturbance index or an apnea hypopnea index, which equals the average number of apnea or hypopnea episodes per hour. I have seen over 100, an estimated 4% of men and 2% of women between 30 and 60 suffer from sleep apnea. This translates to many, many millions of Americans. So what are the treatment options? The ultimate goals for snoring and sleep apnea are the same to stop or decrease collapse. But the individual goals between snoring and sleep apnea vary tremendously. In sleep apnea, we wanna help the patient breathe and get oxygen to the brain. So with sleep apnea, treatments are usually more aggressive. But there are so many contributing factors which can cause these problems. And because the patients differ so dramatically in their anatomy and lifestyle, the treatment for each individual patient varies widely. In addressing options to treat snoring and sleep apnea, I will begin with easy lifestyle changes and progress to devices and finally procedures and surgeries. It is important to get an adequate amount of sleep so you are not so exhausted that you collapse and snore. Avoid alcohol and medications which are sedating. These substances relax the throat and increase collapse. Alcohol, sedatives, tranquilizers, relaxants, sleeping pills, and pain medicines will all worsen snoring or sleep apnea. Lose excess weight through diet and exercise. If a patient is overweight, weight loss will reduce excess fat around the air passages and lessen the amount of tissues causing collapse. 
In mild snoring and sleep apnea, weight loss alone can often cure the problem if there are not other anatomical issues present. In some people, changing their sleeping position off their back to their side will stop their snoring. In many people who snore, helping decongest their nose so they can breathe better at night improves their snoring. Allergies can be treated with avoidance measures, antihistamines, or desensitization shots. The use of breathe-right strips mechanically increases the space in the nose and when in place can decrease blockage or collapse. Nasal steroid sprays can provide nighttime decongestion and can be used every day without the risk of addiction. Chronic nasal obstruction from addiction to over-the-counter decongestant sprays should be treated by an ear, nose, and throat specialist to stop the addictive cycle and treat other contributing problems. There are two medical devices available to help with snoring or sleep apnea. These devices are particularly helpful if the patient has a small lower jaw where the tongue tends to collapse back in the throat during sleep. Mandibular advancement devices are worn like a dental retainer and have been very successful with snoring in patients with small lower jaws which lie posterior to the upper jaw. CPAP, or Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, provides an immediate cure for sleep apnea. It can be worn as a nasal cannula called nasal pillows, a nasal mask, or a full face mask. Whichever mask is used, it is connected via a tube to a generator which blows air under pressure into your nose and mouth while you sleep in order to counteract the pressure of collapse and prevent it. It is painless and works immediately as long as you wear it to bed. Some patients love it and are happy to avoid surgery. Other patients couldn't conceive of wearing something on their face to bed every night. Surgical procedures target a specific anatomical area of blockage in order to improve the space for airflow. This in itself is a limitation if the patient's problem is at more than one location, but for those who have an obvious anatomical area causing collapse or a problem, surgery can lead to a rapid and dramatic improvement. Nasal surgery has never really been shown to cure sleep apnea since it does not address collapse in the throat, but it definitely can improve snoring when the nasal airway is narrowed. A septoplasty straightens a crooked septum inside the nose to improve the space and the ability to breathe through the nose. A nasal polypectomy removes nasal polyps and improves airflow through the nose. A tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy removes large tonsils and adenoids, which is usually the first and often the only step in children with constant snoring or sleep apnea, and also in many adults with snoring. The tongue can also be treated with surgery, but this can be painful and affect speech and swallowing, so most patients choose CPAP or a mandibular advancement device. For sleep apnea, a UPPP, or uvulopallidopharyngoplasty, removes excess soft palate and the uvula, increasing the airway. An injection snoreplasty is a procedure that can be performed in the office for snoring, where the palate is injected with a chemical to stiffen the palate and shrink the uvula to decrease the vibration of tissues and the loudness of snoring. I hope you have learned more about snoring and sleep apnea so that you and your sleep partner may both enjoy a good night's sleep. Sweet dreams, everybody.